Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. My name is Anissa Avon, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is uh, part of the Leading in a Crisis Virtual Summit, Actionable Business and HR Strategies for Navigating Crisis and Change, sponsored by Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. And today, um, I am thrilled to have with us uh, Jill Koo. Hello, Jill. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh. Ah, and Dr. Sandra <laughs> Steen coming back just in time. She got knocked out. I'm assuming the internet went bad on you, Dr. Steen. Uh-oh, she might still think, be posting. Yeah, I think she Yes, we had, a, we had a slight freeze going on, but it looks like we're back. Okay, okay. Good, deal. good deals. Well, we knew that you would join us again. So I'm going to briefly go over our summit and our sponsors, and then we're going to jump right into how to thoughtfully prepare for Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter in the workplace to very polarized and opposite views, and yet something that all of us are going to have to um, have some meaningful uh, conversations around in a very candid and empathetic way. And so I'm thrilled to have you two with us today to help us through this conversation. So as such, I want to say um, thank you to all of our speakers who have made the Leading in a Crisis Summit um, very meaningful uh, over the last few months during um, a number of crises. Um, we're adding speakers all the way through July. So if there is a topic that we haven't covered or a topic you would like to see us go deeper, please reach out, let us know. We would be um, grateful to get your opinion and your feedback on that. A little bit about our sponsors. Um, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group is a group of super talented multi-channel marketing and communication strategy experts, and without whom we would not have been able to pull off this summit. So thank you, David and his team. If you or your team would benefit from some superhero marketing specialists, do reach out to David and let him know that I referred you. Uh, my name is Anissa Avon, and I am the CEO and founder of Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. We are a enterprise learning and development firm. We have coaches and master trainers in every major metropolitan area in the U.S. and in key hubs globally. So what I'm really um, interested in sharing with you guys today are the two programs that are sponsoring the summit. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it. This is not a sales pitch. Um, but because of the nature of the reality that we're living in now, our outplacement programs have been um, updated and revised to address multi-level uh, employees in an organization. We may support you in those outplacement packages, um, it would be my honor to learn a little bit more. Also want to let you also know about our anti-racism facilitated dialogue circles, along with our diversity and inclusivity programs um, and experts like the two that are on our call today. Um, we also have put together out of a request for how exactly do we start having these dialogues um, when, when it is such, a, a, when so many of us are triggered. Um, and so our experts have put together just a facilitated dialogue circle um, with the intention being support awareness to educate, to develop simple communication skills around empathy um, and around uh, greater understanding and allyship, which leads us to our experts today. Um, I am very pleased to introduce you to Jill Koo. Um, Jill is a certified senior professional in HR um, and a senior certified professional with the Society of HR Management. She is the founder of Energize HR and Energize HR is a consulting, is an HR consulting firm that focuses on training and strategic recruiting and organizational development and of course HR support. And prior to founding her own company, Jill served as a VP for a Houston-based PEO, um, where they received numerous awards, including the Best Place to Work and Inc. 5000 Fastest Growing Companies. Jill brings over 20 years of strategic HR experience into play. Also wanna introduce you to Dr. Sandra Steen. Um, she is a CEO 
an executive leadership coach, business consultant, master facilitator, and keynote motivational speaker and author. She is the founder and CEO of Sandra Steen Consulting. She's an internationally acclaimed speaking, training, and consulting uh, consultant, and her firm is as well. Um, she is an established in the areas of inspiration and motivation, sales and customer service, communication and leadership, and diversity in the workplace. So you two, I am going to turn this over to you. Please, what did I miss and what are we going to learn today? Well, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity and for this platform. So it's certainly relevant to the timing and the current events. And today, what we're going to do in the time that we're spending together, we're going to get towards some uh, definition of racism. We hear that term, but what really does it mean? And how does that differ from a stereotype or a bias? We're also going to leave you with a position for progress. So we have some uh, quick steps that you can evaluate on how to upgrade yourself. And then um, my colleague, the very talented Jill Kub, will be talking about hashtags and those perceptions versus principles. Hashtag Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. So that's going to be a lot of our conversation. We'll look at some survey and some statistics, and we'll leave you with some actionable steps for a discrimination-free workplace. And we've gotten some great questions. And Anissa, I understand that there will be questions that will, can come through the chat box, and we'll address some of those as well. So let's get started with something that we all know. We are not a monolithic culture. Let's start there. We're not a monolithic culture. And what does that mean? So, um, and, and I want to break this down because we're not a monolithic culture. And uh, the outer circle, you've seen that probably in many instances, if you've gone through any type of inclusion training. There are primary ways that we are uh, divided. And then there are secondary ways in which we differ. Let me take the divided and say differ. So there's work background things like education, religious beliefs, and those are things that uh, can, you know, draw boundaries and lines and differing opinions and perspectives. And then the green is basically our assignment at birth. Now we know that sometimes the choices can lead that assignment to change, but for the most part, age, race, ethnicity, physical qualities, gender, and appearances, those are some assignments that can come with birth. What does this really mean? We're going to differ, and I want to bring this point out as we're talking about current events, the African-American culture, the Black culture, uh, those are two particular terms that are uh, preferred among Black and African-Americans. They are not a monolithic culture either. You're going to find within the Black race, there are going to be differing opinions about the same topic. So I want to keep that in mind because no one person can speak for all Black or African Americans. Neither can one person speak for all white Americans. So what does this mean? Let's look at how we process ourselves for, for self-examination because all of us need to look in the mirror. But before we look in the mirror, we've got to ask ourselves, how did we learn the views that we hold? Where did they come from? Well, first of all, we're all born into the world with no information. We're born with purpose, but we had no information. That is true. However you look at it, it's true. Now, what happens is we're born into the world we're being influenced by people we trust. I want to stop and emphasize that and even give a picture of how that looks because who are the people we trust? Mom, dad, it could be family members, it could be a teacher, it could be a preacher, but they're people we trust. Now, I want to use this uh, example because I call this the bitter cup. And so, Let's say that somebody that you know and trust, they put into the cup, those people are no good. You can never trust those people. 
And you know what? I never liked those people. Now here's their bitter cup and their influences. And what do they do? They give you the cup and say, drink. And now you have drink, you're drinking the bitter cup. What are you learning? You're learning stereotypes. You're learning biases. You're learning myths and misinformation. One of the bitter cups, you know, if I take it away from race and go gender, uh, how many times has mom said, I don't trust men. They're no good. Look at what your father did to me. Okay, here, drink. And so the bitter cup gets passed on and it's misinformation. Now, what happens in the cycle of self-examination is that we are enhancing the learning or we're contradicting it. Now, where are we getting the learning or the contradiction? We're getting it from the media, news, what we're watching on CNN or Fox News, you, you name it. it. It's going to contradict or it's going to continue to enforce what the bitter cup gave us. It could be social media. All you have to do is scroll. And there are people and they may post an opinion, a thought that was based on something five years ago. Oh, never mind the facts. <laughs> this is my opinion. And we're learning or we're being contradicted. It could be at church. It's, it's learned or contradicted. It could be within your social circles. How many people uh, are choosing people that have like opinions or are in our social circles, are we choosing people who just think like us or they may bring a different opinion? Personally, I like having differing opinions. It helps to sharpen the saw. Now, what happens in the cycle is that we have a reaction to what we learn. We judge it and we adapt it as behavior. And then there's an action or a reaction. We adapt it, the bitter cup, we're drinking it. Now we're adapting, judging the behavior. And what happens? It gets passed on to the next generation. So we ask ourselves in the self-examination cycle, how do we break it? And we want to we want to continue on with that question and that thought because we want to face the future with knowledge. Now, how do we face the future with knowledge? First of all, I want to drive this point home. Do not be afraid. Fear is an attraction. What you fear the most comes upon you. If you put your eyes on missing, if you're on a bicycle and you want to miss the tree and you're so afraid of miss of the tree or run into the tree, what happens when you stare at it? You run into it. And so our fears must be faced with knowledge because if we up the knowledge, the fear will come down. How do we increase the knowledge? Through training and coaching and conscious choosing. And I'm going to suggest to you, I'm not going to go through the details of it. I'm going to suggest to you there are four, in, uh, actually five relationships that everybody needs to grow. If you want to grow, you need these five relationships. You need a role model. You need a coach and a mentor. You need friends. You need a partner. And you need a community. With those five relationships, we are positioned to question our stereotypes. We can question our biases and our myths, and that's gonna challenge us to learn new information. And what's gonna happen when we learn new information? We're gonna have a reaction to love and empower. Now, let me just stop because I'm talking to corporate America. Corporate America, we don't have emotions, right? We're, emotions are not allowed in corporate. That's the soft stuff, right? Wrong. See, the thing is, we say that that soft and emotions aren't allowed, but the emotion of anger shows up at work. The emotion of frustration shows up at work. I'm suggesting that the emotion of love is also appropriate, not in the context of any type of sexual harassment. I'm saying love in the context of understanding and support. You know what? Nothing will change until you at some point will touch it with love. You can continue to touch it with anger. You can touch it with frustration. You can touch it with every other emotion, but the context of change happens when love hits it in some, and love and understanding hits it in some context. Then this will result in transformation, renewed minds, both mentally and spiritually. Again, we are in corporate America. 
but we are also mental beings as well as spiritual beings and we must touch every area of our being now once we've done that perhaps we can get rid of this golden calf of the age you know a golden calf is something you worship it's something you bow down to and i'll say that if there's anything that's being worshiped at this time and at this uh in the 2020 year it's the opinion all you have to do is scroll people are not bowing down to facts they're bowing down to feelings uh, don't don't confuse my opinion with the facts <laughs> you know this is where i bow and not only are we asking uh are we bowing to the opinion we're asking everybody else to bow to our opinions now what i want to do is take you through a really quick little exercise and what i'm going to do in just a moment i'm going to flash an image and if you have the ability to write, write. If not, you can make a mental picture because I'm going to ask you to describe what I flash for you. Okay, so I want you to give me a description. I'm going to put up image number one. Now, I collected these images out of magazines. I have a, a collection of pictures for magazines. So uh, these are magazine pictures, and I've had these for over 10 years, and I use them for various different things, including this. So this is an image, and I'm going to ask you to describe this image. Describe this image, okay? Let's look at the next image. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. When you look at this image, give me a description of this image, okay? Got it? All right. Uh, okay, good. I got a uh, Shayla. Thank you. All right. We've got some descriptions. Somebody said cowboys. Somebody said a kind older woman. Thank you. Let's get another image. All right, give me a description of this image. A description of this image. All right, and I got a two men and cowboys for the next image. Okay, this is a disagreement. Somebody's saying conflict, okay? All right, those are, are your descriptions. Okay, let's go back to uh, the first image. Let's go back to the first image. Now, somebody said a kind, older, thoughtful woman. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a description, it's an interpretation. But we do it all the time. And it leads us into our biases and it seems just so, you know, it, it seems so pure. Yeah, kind, thoughtful woman. Uh, but how many times have we looked at an image like this and said, uh, life is over for her. You know, she's really, really too old to be doing anything of much and she looks pretty sad. How about that this image is a best-selling, a New York Times best-selling author? How about that? Um, that's not a first interpretation. Why? Because we're in the circle of our influence and our experience. Let's look at the next image. And uh, we had cowboys. We had um, two gentlemen. A description would be two men with white shirts, jeans on, and hats. An interpretation would be cowboys. But let me just tell you, or you can imagine that if I were flashing this image to African Americans, the interpretation would be racist. That's not a description, it's an interpretation. Well, if I have some type of stereotype or bias that all men who dress like this are also racist, guess what? When this image shows, that's what I think. Let's look at the third image, feeling over facts. Now, we heard conflict, controversy. Now, these are actually, in, in uh, various different audiences, I've heard things like criminals. I've heard thugs. I've heard rappers. All interpretations, never a uh, description in which I request it. Now, here's the deal. These young men are recording artists, very successful recording artists, and they don't do rap. They do some really traditional music. But because of the biases and the, and the stereotypes in our mind, we have an interesting kind of interpretation. Now, let me just give you a moment to think about this. If I were to flash these images, perhaps to rookie police officers who were being trained and they were given no information and said 
you're going to have to pull the trigger on one of these images, but you have no background information, what image do you think they would choose? I think most of us know that. So what I want to do now is go into some self-examination where we look at what we mean by stereotypes. Stereotypes are generalizations. We all have them. Part of them can be true, but we start to see everybody the same. We have no ability to differentiate based on our circle of influence, based on our bitter cup, we start to see anybody with the white shirt and cowboy hat is racist, anybody as a young black male criminal. And so we have to have self-examination. Now let's go into what our bias is. Biases become now stereotype is a generalization, but then I start to place judgment on that stereotype. And I have an unfavorable opinion without knowledge or experience. It doesn't make it right because I have an experience, it just is. So I'm not putting wrong or right to it, but let's define what it is. So preju uh, prejudice versus preference. So a bias is more toward a prejudice. So I have an unfavorable opinion based on something. I see you with a white hat uh, and you have jeans on. Oh, my, my, my opinion is you gotta be racist. Okay, I see the young black male, oh, he's up to no good. All right, so let's talk about what the next uh, definition would be. Now, when we're understanding biases, I want, because of the nature of our audience, I just want to raise your awareness where these biases can show up. There are subtle assumptions that can happen and have big impact on who you're hiring, uh, work conditions, uh, exceptions, promotions, terminations. Uh, so the self-examination, the look in the mirror is to know if I have an unfavorable opinion based on a previous experience and does it have a subtle or big impact on some power that I've been given? Have I been given a bitter cup that I've been drinking from from even childhood that's now influencing my decisions as an adult. Let's move on and talk about prejudice. Now prejudice is a judgment and it is a positive or a negative attitude and it's not based on objective facts or experience. So you start to see that prejudice and biases are really, they are very connected and they have a close kinship to each other prejudice. Let's look at our next definition. Wow, there it is, the isms. The isms. Isms go beyond I don't like you. Isms go into the realm of I'm going to deprive you of something you may be uh, entitled to, but because of my prejudice or bias, I'm going to deprive you of it. So if I have any type of prejudice or bias toward older workers, I like young, I like millennial, I like people with energy. And so when I see the first image of the older woman, I don't think New York Times bestseller. I think not capable, older, life is over. And so I've gone into ageism. If I have a previous experience, with women and I think that it's a man's world. And so my preference, my prejudice, my bias is toward putting men in powerful position. I have gone beyond I don't like, I actually deprive women who are capable and I am now in sexism. And so what does an ism combine? An ism combines power and prejudice. So I don't like you, so I'm going to deprive you of something that you're entitled to. And now we have racism. So let's go into self-examination. And what is the question that we all must ask today? What do I truly believe? Have I had the bitter cup experience that has created any myths, misinformation, 
Have I had a bad experience that now I look into the mirror and can I say this? Do I stand against injustice and racism? Now, let me give you the caveat to this. I'm not talking about a political platform. I, it doesn't matter what you believe. You could believe that the moon is made of cheese, but do you stand against injustice and racism? You could be on the left side, you could be on the right side, but do you believe that you should stand against injustice and racism? I would say today that racism has now evolved. It is no longer black against white. It's everybody against injustice and racism. How are we seeing it now? We're seeing the world join in. So it's all humanity saying we stand against injustice and racism. Now, what happens? This is a yes or no question. Do I stand against injustice and racism? And when the answer is yes, you're good to go to position yourself to progress. If the answer is, I really don't stand against injustice and racism, then it's back to the mirror to ask yourself why. What happened in your circle of influence? And how can you get to a point where you can say, yes, I stand against injustice and racism? I believe that every leader has to get to a point where they're asserting this statement. So if it's the governor, he's saying, regardless of his political party, he's saying to the state, we stand against injustice and racism. If it's the CEO, he's saying, the company is saying, we stand against injustice and racism. If it's the family leader, the father is saying to the family, we stand against injustice and racism. If it's the pastor of a church, he's saying to the church, we stand against injustice and racism. And I believe that once we all stand in a unified voice to say yes to this, we can go to whatever political corner, whatever belief system, we can go back to that, but we have a unified platform against injustice and racism. And now we're positioned to progress. And how do we position ourselves for progress? One, permit yourself to be upgraded. So you choose to learn, you choose to grow. And let me just put a little bit of caveat to that. Please don't put the pressure of your growth on any race of people. Well, those people need to tell me what to call them. And that is some truth to that because people, we can even ask them, what do you prefer? Do you per prefer black? Do you prefer African-American? I can tell you colored. Uh, we're not monolithic, but I can't find anybody that likes to be called colored. And as certainly we would avoid the N word at all costs. But beyond that, we, we put the responsibility of learning on ourselves and not on someone else. And we give someone the gift of listening. When's the last time somebody listened to you? We all want to be heard. We all want to have somebody that will just listen to us. We're not always wanting you to shake your head in agreement. Just hear me out. So give that gift on a daily basis. Honor feelings. Don't discount them. So remember, your golden calf is what you worship. But don't expect everybody to worship your opinion. Um, don't discount the feelings of others. Um, and give a three-step apology if you must. Now, I've said this to thousands, and for some reason, it becomes a big takeaway. I'm going to give you uh, an apology that I haven't found anybody disagree with this type of apology. When you apologize in this format, people will love you and they will thank you. Remember, there's no fear of making a mistake because we're not fearful. We, if we make a mistake, we do it in three steps. First step, this is what happened. John, this is why I called you and referred to you in this manner. This is why, this is what happened. The second step, this is why it happened. Well, in my upbringing, I was always taught that that was the respectful thing to say. I had no idea that it had shifted. My apologies. Third step and most important step of an apology is, John, this is why it won't happen again, because I'm taking the upgrade and the information that you've given me today, and I won't be caught making that remark to any person of color. Thank you for this upgrade moment. 
Who can argue with that? Nobody. Three steps. And then the last step again. I know we're in the workplace, but don't you have a company that you've ever loved? Don't you have a boss that you loved? Don't you have a project that you loved? You know what? Passion is at the height of the emotional pyramid. Remember Abraham Hicks? And he said that if you find passion, you'll find joy and you'll find enthusiasm, which is at the height of the emotional pyramid. But if you go into boredom and if you go into frustration, you'll find yourself in the downward spiral headed toward depression. So find the passion, love it, find something you can love. You know, I've even found a way to touch my fears with love. When my fear shows up, I say, thank you fear, because you have shown me a gap in my faith, in my ability to be positive. And I wouldn't have known it had you not shown up. Now, thank you for showing up, you can leave now. And so instead of fighting it and hitting it with anger and frustration, I touched it with love and now the transformation can happen. So remember the topic and whatever the person or the conversation, touch it with love and understanding. Because remember this as we get ready to go into some more practical ways of dealing with this whole idea of Black Lives Matter um, is that everybody, everybody simply, they want to be heard, they want to be understood. And uh, you have the key to that and you approach it with no fear, no fear. You got your three-step apology ready and you're ready to move into the knowledge and the knowledge will take down the fear. And so my colleague is going to take us through some background information, some t statistics, um, and then we're going to find out, we've got answers to your questions and uh, she's got some real practical uh, ways to handle this from an HR perspective. So Jill, take oh, it away. Dr. Steen, that was amazing. Thank it's you. hard, you're a hard act to follow, <laughs> let me tell you. And I, don't, I do not have any props. Um, so, so I am getting to the heart of, of this presentation. Well, actually, Dr. Steen did the heart and now I'm getting to the, to the actual meat of Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. I think that this is definitely one of the most polarizing hashtags that we've had in, in my history, which it seems like it shouldn't be polarizing, but a lot of it is understanding and fear. Black Lives Matter hashtag was created by three black women after George Zimmerman was acquitted from murder. Um, he, it just, the outrage of no accountability. And we all can relate to and connect with the lack of accountability. When, when crimes happen, when people do you wrong, you just want justice. And so that is what the crux of Black Lives Matter is and was um, started for. I think that there has been some radical um, people that have attached themselves to Black Lives Matter and people see that as, I believe Black Lives Matter, but I'm afraid of the rioting. I'm afraid of the looting. I'm afraid of police being targeted to be murdered. And so there is that perception. All Black Lives Matter. I think we can all agree on that. At least we should agree on that. And all lives matter. I think in principle, we can agree on that. But the hashtag all lives matter is seen as a protest to Black Lives Matter. It's not saying that Black Lives Matter only. It's just that we matter. That if we're killed, that there's justice. That we're in an equal playing field as everyone else. So it's, although it seems innocuous, all lives matter. That is the response. And actually I will say, if I have any senior leadership or HR professionals on the call, 
Um, I've seen on LinkedIn where they've responded to posts with hashtag all lives matter. And it is so polarizing. It is not, oh, okay, Pollyanna, everybody matters. It is black lives are documented um, as being targeted in racial profiling. That is a fact. And we're gonna look at some other things. This is people's perception. And, and when we look at perception, it can be so complex, but equally valid points um, from differing perspectives can appear to be contradictory. So all lives matter, black lives matter. How can they be contradictory? And they are from different perspectives, the truth, that person's truth, because some of us have only fed our mind with um, a certain news outlet or a certain group of friends or certain social media. So I'm challenging everyone to really get down to the facts because just like Dr. Steen said, on both sides, there's, there's misinformation. Check your facts and let's get to what we're supposed to do at work. Um, I want to talk about business. So Starbucks in 2018 had two African Americans that were waiting um, for a business meeting. Um, and my, me and my fiance can relate to this because we're in, we do real estate deals as well. And so you meet people in restaurants, you meet them at Starbucks. They were there early for a business meeting for a large real estate deal that was going to impact their families. Well, um, their business partner, the, the guy in the silver vest was running a little late and they were strategizing on, on what to discuss. And the manager at that Starbucks said, um, you need to buy something or leave. And they said, well, we're waiting for a business associate. We're going to, um, as soon as he gets here, we'll order. I've done that. I'm sure many other people have done that. That it, it, it doesn't even occur to me that that would be a problem. They were arrested because they wouldn't leave that Starbucks. And the, the gentleman in the silver vest is like, what is happening? These guys were held in a cell till midnight. And that's where the, the hashtag start, uh, going to Starbucks while black. That is injustice. That's something that a lot of us can't relate to. So why am I bringing this up? Well, Starbucks just last week um, had banned their staff from wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts and pins. And uh, you know they, they mentioned it is part of our policy to not wear any political or religious um, items to, to work because it can incite divisiveness and, and violence. And we wanna make everybody feel comfortable and included in our Starbucks restaurants. The problem with that is Pride, uh, Pride Month was just last month or this month, and they are allowing the LGBTQ community to wear pins and shirts to represent Pride, um, which some people are don't feel comfortable with that. So it's like, why did you pick and choose? So they came back and they said, well, we're, and, and I did read all of their, their articles. They're very um, pro, um, pro racial uh, justice and they want diversity, but they didn't want Black Lives Matter. They felt that that was divisive. So I'm cautioning all business owners to know that Black Lives Matter they, even though you may not agree with everything the movement is, is doing right now, like defunding police, uh, which scares people, um, that the Black Lives Matter principle means something to so many people. And when you forbid people from, from saying Black Lives Matter, it is, it's crushing. Oh, we do have comments. <laughs> um, so the next day, um, this was on June 11th, the next day, because of the protests, Starbucks came back and said, you can wear your Black Lives Matter pins until we create our own t-shirts. So it is 
it is something that's not no pun intended black or white there's you have to be principle centered for your organization you have to create high trust but you're also representing your company to the community in which you serve and so this is a this is not an easy subject and it's very hard to do it in an hour uh, i was telling anisa this is conversations that we have to continue having over and over again and and stay relevant with the news today i saw on the news that um an employee was fired because they had black lives matter um face mask on uh the, and and they were all supposed to wear face masks well he had black lives matter on it he was terminated and that made the news the, it, and you can literally as hr professionals follow the letter of your handbook but you have to understand the impact in the in what principle it is. So as a leadership team, these are larger discussions. It's not simple. It's not cut and dry. So Sherm had an article, and I encourage all HR professionals to go on the Sherm site because they do have a lot of resources um, for uh, creating diversity in your work force but they are they have a great article called don't be silent and tips to diffuse workplace tensions and and the author of the article broke out the perspectives into four areas and these are generalizations people can say you know i agree with some of this and i agree with some of that i don't fully fall into these buckets just like anything else but uh, justice requires action is um, an area where people are like, hey, we need to do whatever we can to bring justice to our cause. And then we have the second uh, uh, area perspective, which is, you know what, I'm fully supportive of nonviolent protest uh, and we need to make change. I would think a lot of a lot of uh, majority of people fit into that. There are a segment of the population that feel that this is this is not a big deal. We're blowing this out of proportion. I don't know anybody who's been discriminated against. Uh, this is just a few bad apples and we need to get back to business. The protests are unnecessary. And then there's the ones uh, that believe they're fear they're fearing. They see the news, they see social media. Uh, maybe they had personal experience with rioters or looters um, or their police department. And they're like, we need law and order. We need to bring law and order back in place. We need to, to, to um, shut this down. So my, my question to you is, is there a wrong perspective or is a perspective something we need to work with? We need to educate. We need to share what that company perspective is with culture, values, creating trust, creating a safe environment for people to have critical conversations. Uh, Dr. Steen put it beautifully. If you make a mistake, which we will all make a mistake, you need to be able to say, I don't want to offend you. You are my teammate. I'm here to learn. I'm here to, for us to have a good working relationship and, and Everybody strive for that. Um, it isn't that they can't find the solution. And again, a lot of people don't feel that they, there is a problem. They can't see the problem because in their world, from their perspective, there is no problem. So there was a Pew research study done um, that asked the question, do you feel like there is a major issue for blacks in discrimination? Uh, about half of the white respondents said yes, and 84% of the respondents who were black said yes, there is racial discrimination. 51% um, said they had le less access to high paying jobs, 76 said they had less access to, to high paying jobs. Um, lack of, of good role models, you had 45% make that judgment that Blacks don't have access to good role models. And more than half of the, the white recipients and or of, of the researcher research respondents said that they had family instability. 
why 42% said they had family. And, and so these are their perspectives shown in a research study. Also, this is how does race impact getting ahead? The white respondent said 45% said it helped a little or it helped a lot. Half of them said it doesn't matter. They hired me for my qualifications. 52% said it hurt them. They, they weren't able to get ahead because of their race. Look at the disparity there. That's perception. So if you don't think there's a problem, then you need to see from another perspective, from another side of the issue. These are facts. The, the median annual earnings for workers with a bachelor degree, a four-year degree, is 20% less for Af African-American workers uh, than they are for white workers and Asian workers. And for advanced degrees, it's almost 45% difference. That's shocking. And so this is where HR and business owners need to be able to measure their salaries, their hiring, promotions. This, this should not happen. We should not have this much disparity. So next steps. We need to, sorry, we need to educate ourselves. Just like Dr. Seen said, we need to educate ourselves on what the facts are uh, so that we can have some good conversation, we can steer our companies, we can be relevant to know what's happening in the landscape and not say, I'm just gonna put blinders on, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna hope this goes away. This whole thing will blow over. It's not gonna blow over. Mm -hmm. We need to address it. We need to train our teams. In some of the most important ways that we can train our teams, other than diversity inclusion, other than on our policies, which should be a, a zero tolerance anti-discrimination policies, is that we need to train them to have more empathy. We need to increase their emotional intelligence. We need to help them learn how to de-escalate a situation because that is a critical skill in today's society. You see minor incidences that just spiral out of control. We all need those skills. We need management and leadership development. And then we have to track. Whatever gets measured gets done. We need to absolutely track all the applicants versus hire by race. We need to look at promotion. We need to look at salaries. Is there a disparity? Terms. Now we can say, I'm not racist. We need to measure, we need to train, we need to do self-evaluation. I'm not biased, I'm not prejudiced. Listen, we all have biases, we all have prejudice. We need to make sure that it doesn't turn into an ism, as Dr. Steen said. Uh, and then we need feedback surveys. I'm a big fan of the Net Promoter Score, where, which you actually get a measure and an open-ended question. And then you can see, you can stay connected with your employees. I will tell you the, the, the teams and the cultures that have high trust amongst their teammates uh, and they have transparency and are able to, to have conversations are going to grow stronger. Those that are toxic, that have silos, that can't communicate are gonna struggle. I'm frozen. There we go. Um, specifically on talent management, we need to look at um, our current salaries by position and demographic and ban salary history questions. And why do I say that? Because we all want a good deal. If somebody only want, if they made um, $30,000 at their last job, I'll give them 31,000, even though the salary ban for this job is 40 to 45. You have to pay, you have to create salary bans and pay what that position is, is, is at market. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have not only um, uh, disparity, you could have discrimination suits. It, it, it really is, it may be um, 
uh, innocent saying, oh, well, that's all they wanted. They're happy. But no, as a company, it's best practice and have objective screening and performance tools. Uh, use a validated profile assessment. Uh, make sure that it is valid. Um, make sure that that it 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 mirrors for the success or predictive success of that position. And also, these are the top 10 de-escalation uh, tips. You can pull this up on Crisis Prevention Institute, but be empathetic and non-judgmental. Um, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all learning. We just need to be patient and think the best. Give benefit of the doubt. Think the best of each other. Respect each other. If something is offensive to somebody, don't, by all means, do not do it intentionally because it's your right. That is not tolerated in a workplace, in most workplaces. Stay true to your company values, your culture, and what your overall objective is. And avoid overreacting. Focus on feelings, ignore challenging questions because some people will bait, set limits, and choose wisely what you insist upon. But do not shrink when you are entitled to something and allow silence for reflection in time for decisions. People are really challenging themselves. A lot of people are really challenging themselves and, and people don't like to make mistakes, but we need to give some space to be able to have those conversations. So now we're to the questions and I know we have a hard stop in seven minutes, so we need to <laughs> We need to answer these questions. So um, the, this was a loaded question. All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter has generally been used in response to Black Lives Matter awareness campaigns. And I would say that is not entirely true because I know that people have used All Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter not to um, in conflict or to dismiss Black Lives Matter, I think that there have been genuine um, use of it, uh, but now it is clear that it is um, in, in, in contrast to Black Lives Matter. And Jill, Matter. If, if I could just add something into this uh, particular question. Sure. Uh, there is all uh, Black Lives Matter, the statement, and then there's Black Lives Matter, the movement. Mm -hmm. And um, so I use the, the context of you can have a bipartisan support for a particular bill, both sides of the house support it. And then someone with a selfish agenda and extreme view will hitch their wagon to what's been supported. And now though there's massive support for the bill, what's been hitched to it becomes divisive. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to keep that in mind because there are even African Americans and Blacks who are not in support of some of the divisiveness that's hitched to the movement, but we stand in support of the statement. And I think that we have to make, uh, make that known because there are some troublesome things that are, I mean, you, it's public knowledge and you there are things that you can't support maybe in in the in the movement but there is nothing that can't be supported about the statement but we do make that distinction absolutely absolutely um how should organizations uh, do their part to eradicate issues of racism and hate speech in the workplace like all lives matter so um Dr. Steen, would you say that hashtag All Lives Matter is hate speech? Well, uh, once again, it's a perspective. And so mm -hmm. if I'm going to the circle and everybody's got their uh, own social circles and in your social circles, um, you're hearing and you believe that when people say all lives matter, they're marginalizing Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And you will hear that yes, all lives matter, but black lives are being murdered. Mm -hmm. And so the urgency for all black, for black lives matter has usurped the, uh, the all lives matter because not all lives are being threatened by right. the police. Yeah. So 
I wouldn't call it hate speech, but I would say this, upgrade when you say it, that you may need to preface that it is not marginalizing the Black Lives Matter, the statement. Again, there's a statement and there's the movement. Mm -hmm. So you may have to qualify where you, um, where you are because can all lives matter when black lives are being threatened? Mm -hmm. And that is the question. Um, you know, and I said this earlier, this is not a black versus white issue. This is everybody against racism and injustice now. I mean, when I saw Ireland, (laughs) <laughs> protesting <laughs> I knew we had hit the mainstream this is humanity now and so humanity stands together all lives matter but if one of us is hurt all of us are hurt right so Absolutely. All, lives, all lives can't matter till the black lives are free till the black lives are not being mm-hmm. put in a position of injustice and racism and I believe that that attitude will uh, sink well with just about everybody, but nobody's going to always agree with anything. And and being patient with people because you you may have somebody completely ignorant to how offensive that is and not meaning to offend anybody. So or just not aware, just having that conversation. Um, and honestly, in the workplace, if you have somebody offended. You need to work it out. You need to say, hey, this is, this is why this person is offended by it and have that conversation. That's a good point, Jill. And I would add to that as well, that I will say to all Americans that it would be better to say the wrong thing than to be silent. Mm-hmm. Now, um, because silence is tr- totally derogatory now. Silence is in the same category as we watch. I mean, this has been a tipping point. And I, I also like to make this, this distinction. George Floyd is more of a catalyst than a hero. Martin Luther King is a hero. He worked and he, he built one of the largest armies and never picked up a gun. That's hero status. Here's this man, George Floyd, lovely man, but his death became a catalyst because we all watched it. It was unequivocal. We couldn't deny what we were seeing. And we, when we saw police officers who were silent, we believed that they murdered as well. Now, this is why it goes back to my first statement. We can't be silent. Because if you can watch what we all watched and be silent, what makes you any different from those police officers? Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid, but silence is a, uh, cannot be consent. We can know, and, and I'm saying that all you, not all you need to say, but what you really need to say is I stand against injustice and racism. Mm-hmm. And when you say that, then you can go back to whatever corner it is you believe. Absolutely. But that must be said, and that must be said by all leaders. Right, that's perfect. Well said. I, I want to say, you guys, I actually texted my next call. So we have a little more time to answer these other questions. If oh, you- good. <laughs> okay. and, and going back to silence, um, we can't be silent if we see discrimination in the workplace. Yeah. We can't be dismissive if yeah. somebody has an issue and especially have seen it in HR, you'll have leaders go, well, is HR, they're, they're leaning towards the employer. They're leaning towards the manager. No, we're leaning towards the best interest of the company. Yes. And, and, you know, I've been guilty of it. Um, it, even when it's directed at me, um, I've stayed silent and, and it's, it's hard to speak up. It's like, oh, you don't care, Jill. You're, you know, you're one of the guys. Um, it's, it is, it's hard. We can no longer tolerate that because other people are impacted. Yes. Um, how should organizations, um, uh, make efforts to educate executives, managers, employees about racial disparities, unconscious bias? Uh, well, we need to have trainings, <laughs> several trainings, not a one hour training. You need to have a training program that really gets into the heart of what unconscious bias is, 
um, how their bias can affect in the hiring, pay, promotion, uh, coaching, giving opportunities, and then also um, the, the hairstyles is a big thing. We, we cannot mandate somebody to have professional hair that we deem is professional. Like, what makes that professional? We need to say, okay, if you do not have your hair straightened, it's not professional. We don't like that. If it's in cornrows, that's, that's not professional. Like we have got to, um, we've got to stop the stereotyping. Absolutely. And not be afraid to draw the boundaries where it's extreme. Mm -hmm. And um, I've seen some situations where it wasn't the hairstyle, but it might've been the hair color that was not reflective of the culture. Mm -hmm. So the purple and, you know, are two colors. I, you know, I like purple and gold, but not in my hair. And so, you mm -hmm. know, if, if that becomes an issue, then the, the culture has a right to speak to that, but make it very, very equitable. I would mm -hmm. also say yes. this, Jill, that um, sometimes, and you have um, done a lot of work in this realm, and, and I have a great deal of respect for that because cultures that don't have a value well-defined, they're going to have issues with discrimination and all of these things. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding when a culture is well-defined, see, if I have a culture that says one of our core values is respect and humility, then I can fall back on respect and humility. And that's a building yeah. block for all of these other issues. But if I don't have a culture that has respect for each other, then I'm starting from the ground up. It's kind of like, you know, uh, an African-American goes into a particular restaurant and they're not given good service. So they said it was racism. But because the waitress was not well trained, she just gave bad service to everybody. But mm -hmm. for the African-American, it felt like it was based on my race. But if I'm giving good service to everybody, guess what? I have corrected racism. If I'm giving good service to everybody, I have corrected any racial disparity. So sometimes the culture has to build from the ground up what's broken and it will fix a lot of these things. But if your culture is broken and is not well-defined and anything goes, you've got a lot more work to do than somebody's well-defined. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very well said. Our third question, how should organizations proactively encourage a culture of diversity within the workplace and provide an environment where Black African Americans feel seen, heard, and able to connect or be mentored by other Black African Americans within the company? Um, Dr. Steen, we went through this question and I'm going to let you answer this. <laughs> Um, you know, here I want to say that uh, the statement of inclusiveness has to be stated from the top. We stand against. I'm, I'm being repetitive. I, uh, you know, it's planned redundancy. I will say it over and over. You need to say I stand against uh, injustice and racism. That needs to be stated. Now, encouraging that culture of diversity is not going to happen by throwing a three-hour workshop at it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, because, you know, the shelf yeah. life of, of workshops or training has, is two weeks at best when it's done well. So there has to be a culture of coaching. Now, do African Americans have to be coached by other African Americans? I say no. Mm -hmm. I say they have to be coached by people of likeness. And so there is a race, but then there's also personality. And just because we share the same skin tone does not mean that we share the same uh, values. And so we start to match people on other measurables, both EQ and personality and background. And when we have a, when we have a, uh, a, an aspect of success that becomes colorblind, then there is no issue because I have equal access. I have ability to be coached by the best whether they're black or white. And I believe that that is also encouraging a culture of diversity. So where are those great coaches and how will every race have access to them and be coached up? But uh, once again, if your organization does not have a coaching 
uh, a, a coaching and feedback friendly environment, none of this will work. Mm -hmm. I do. I, I'm in the process of finishing up a book called the eight minute coaching session and you can do it in eight minutes and do it well. But if you're not coaching, I don't care how much diversity training you're doing. It has no foundation for sustainability. Yeah. And then it's, it's just check the box, check the box. And that's there's, not there's what we're no, here to do. Uh, yeah. It, it's not building a culture of trust. So absolutely. Yeah, Jill, I, I think, and I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, <laughs> I could, I could, I could say something wrong myself and whatever, but I'm going to say that there's a tipping point with George Floyd. And again, I call George a catalyst. Um, some may do hero worship, but I quantify heroes differently, but his life and the way it was taken has caused a tipping point that I believe there is no turning back this time. Mm -hmm. I believe that the time of giving lip service to this is over. Right. I believe that the time of saying, let's just get back to what we used to do is mm -hmm. over. I, I agree. And I it, believe that yeah. you're ha the, the time of silence is over. The time mm -hmm. of hiding is over. And so we've got to move away from any type of fear because change is here. It is not business as usual. And part of what's happened even through the protests and with the pandemics, I mean, 2020, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember when moms used to say, we're going to, I'm going to push you into next year. If you do that again, you wish they would do that right now, right? <laughs> This has been quite 2020 a just 2020 was, has been yeah. uh, some kind of year, but I believe that one of the positive takeaways is that this year is causing us to self correct mm -hmm. because what's broken is an epic fail now. When you put all of the pressure of what we're having to deal with and it was broken already, it's glaring. And we can't go back to what's broken. We can't go back to what's average. We're having to upgrade. And for once, if you talk to, and again, we're not a monolithic culture, but a great majority of Black people were very, very disheartened over the silence of whites when they raised their hands for the George Zimmerman or they raised their hand for the for this, uh, uh, all the names. I can't call all the names. I understand there's over 600. Mm -hmm. But the African-American culture was very, very disheartened by the silence. And now once for this happened, we have worldwide outrage. We've never seen it. So I say to the leaders, it's not going to be business as usual anymore. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find that place of what's been broken and fix it. Self-correct now. Yep. And be very intentional about your culture Absolutely. and how you do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, question four, how should organizations make a tangible effort to source, recruit, and hire qualified Black African Americans, especially in senior leadership and decision-making roles? That is a fantastic question. It is a great question. Um, I would say this is this is a multi-point uh, <laughs> question, but you really need to make sure that you're recruiting from different sources, not just one source. Um, online uh, network, different uh, organizations and associations, and that you're using, again, a, a valid objective tool to evaluate the candidates that come in. And yes. then once they're in, you need to have a succession plan in place that taps into your talent. Now, why wouldn't anybody, every client want to do that? This is something that makes your company better. Now, you will identify if there's biases or prejudice or even racism that's occurring if you have a lower way, a, a very underrepresentative um, Black and African American or and other uh, uh, ethnic groups in your workforce. If it's 100% white, you can't tell me that you can't find any qualified candidates that are 
African American, Hispanic, different races, different sexes. I mean, it's like saying a woman shouldn't is not capable of of being a CEO or in the boardroom. Um, so it's we need to to look at objective measures and objective uh, ways to um, to to do succession planning and to mentor and grow the people within our organizations. And that, that's a, a beautiful point and well stated. Um, I like something you said earlier, and I would like to put a highlight to that. Mm -hmm. And just because an African-American recruit has had a historical low income record, then you take advantage to say, well, they'll be happy with mm -hmm. doing less than what that job really demands. And so in the context of high integrity and character, you wouldn't reward them based on their experience, which may have been racist to begin with. You will reward them at the value of that position. I think that's huge. Also, the best marketing that you have are the African-Americans that are currently hired within your firm. They will talk to many, many other African-Americans and they're going to give them what I call the bathroom talk. So make sure that you're creating an experience that is worth them advertising. Mm -hmm. And second of all, there are some really good uh, ways to find some very, very talented African-Americans in our historically black colleges. They're putting out stellar graduates. And uh, many African-Americans want to go to these types of schools to honor our history, which has been distorted and stolen. We've seen some of the movies. We didn't know that NASA was uh, being supported by an African-American woman. We were putting uh, uh, men on the moon and we had no knowledge that an African-American woman was putting her, her fingerprint on that. There are so many stories of brilliance in our community that has been silent, that has been stolen. And so now in, in self-correcting is to upgrade and be aggressive to know those stories, to know where to find them and to go and say, hey, we've got a great company and we're looking for people like you. They're there. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I would say the upgrade is to get really educated. Because uh, when I saw that movie, and I know many of my white friends that saw the movie were saying, this was not just Black history, this was American history. Why didn't we know that? Mm -hmm. well, I say to you, there are many stories like that that are hidden. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the secret of change is, is to focus all of our energy on not fighting the old, but on building the new. And that is a very old man that said that. <laughs> <laughs> Socrates. Um, but it, it's it's been a pleasure. Anissa, do you want to take over yes, at this point? I, I know sure. we've gone over. Thank you guys so very much. I want to make sure folks know how to get a hold of each of you and, and under what conditions. Why would an organization reach out to you? What kind of work do you do? And um, let's make sure folks know how to get a hold of you. Sure. Um, well, for me, uh, you can uh, reach me on my email. Or, or phone or check out my website, energizehr.com. I help companies become best places to work. I help them uh, create an intentional uh, culture with behaviors that they can measure to. It would be very easy if someone had an intentional culture, they used um, uh, the, 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 the processes and the education that we have, um, and this would be easy. To, to roll out these messages in the training. Um, I also do, I'm an authorized DISC um, provider. I do DISC and five behaviors of a dysfunctional team as well as provide uh, p uh, some assessments for, for objectively screening candidates and finding good talent. Excellent, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's a, a wonderful platform. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And you can find me at uh, sandrastein.com. And um, I help you identify, clarify, and achieve two things. I'm going to help you achieve results and purpose. So I'm going to help you clarify what that purpose is. And I leverage, I help you leverage your most important resource, which is relationships. 
I help you leverage those relationships for profit. So I'm, uh, many times they'll say, Dr. Steen, come and help fix my team. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> so if you want Dr. Steen to come and help fix your team, I am uh, one of my major sweet spots is teaching leaders how to have a coaching conversation in eight minutes or less that will change the trajectory of what's happening to what you want to happen. So call me if you need me. You can do coaching in eight minutes or less, and there's a book coming out soon. But thank you again for the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you guys so very much. This was incredibly informative and, um, you know, tough conversations that we're having to have, and it's time. So, you know, thank (laughs) Thank you both. This was incredibly valuable. Um, Folks, do uh, share the replay. We'll be on our Leading in a Crisis Summit page um, probably within the next few hours. So um, thank you for sharing the message with others and let us know how we can support you. Jill, Dr. Steen, thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Virtual hug. (laughs) (laughs) for all eyes and IDs so